Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is very disturbing. It was definitely a tough one to research and it's honestly a bit scary to see just how much someone can lack empathy and genuinely have absolutely no care or regard for anybody but themselves. It's definitely a tough one to listen to, so make sure you're ready for that. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, GlassesUSA.com. If you're anything like me and you are a blind like me, then you know how expensive it can be and how much of a hassle it can be to get your eyeglasses directly from your eye doctor. However, GlassesUSA.com makes that process so much easier and so much more affordable. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers prescription eyeglasses up to 70% off of retail prices. You can now shop for your prescription eyeglasses online without ever leaving your home, all at affordable prices. GlassesUSA.com offers over 4,000 styles of glasses and sunglasses, including in-home brands like Audido, which is the ones I'm wearing right now. These ones are some of my favorite, as you guys can tell from how often I wear them in these videos. And then I also have these Audido eyeglasses. Audido has been my favorite brand for a little bit now. Then I have my pink pair of Muse sunglasses that I pretty much wear every single day. I love having extra pairs of glasses and sunglasses. I pretty much always have a pair of sunglasses glasses in my car and then I have one in my purse so I can make sure I always have a pair of sunglasses on hand because I have very sensitive eyes to the sun. I always like to have extra pairs of eyeglasses as well. I keep one in my backpack, I keep a pair in my overnight bag and in my car because sometimes I end up sleeping over at a friend's house or I go on vacation and even if I forget to pack a pair of eyeglasses, I can feel confident that I always have one with me. But it doesn't stop there. GlassesUSA.com also offers designer brands like Ray-Ban, Oakley, Gucci, and so many more. You can find any style and color that you can imagine as well as specialty glasses like kids glasses, sports glasses, safety glasses, and so many more. Also with GlassesUSA.com, you can add almost any prescription to any pair of frames including sunglasses and blue light blocking glasses, which is great for people who work from home and are staring at a computer screen all day. They also have this really cool try-on feature where you can put in a picture of yourself to see how the glasses will actually look on you before or spending the money to buy them, which is really helpful when you aren't quite sure exactly what you'll like and what looks good on you. The best part, of course, is the price point. A complete pair of glasses starts at only $30 and free basic prescription lenses are included with every frame. All you do is go online, enter your prescription, place your order, and that's it. You're done. Standard shipping is free on all orders no matter how much you spend, and if for some reason you aren't happy with your order, you have 14 days to return for 100% store credit and exchange or your money back, no questions asked, and 100% hassle-free. The exciting news is that by clicking the link in my description box below, my subscribers can sign up to get 65% off of their first pair, which is such an amazing deal considering their already so affordable. And if you liked any of the glasses that I showed you or the ones that I'm wearing now, those will also be linked down below. So again, make sure you go ahead and click the link down below and head over to glassesusa.com for 65% off of your first pair. Thank you again so much to GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring today's video and for your continued support of this channel. And as I do in all my other videos, I will be taking off these glasses for the remainder of this video because I know the glare is a little bit distracting for some people. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the brutal murder of Anne McGuire. Anne McGuire was born on April 5th, 1953, and was 61 years old when her life was taken from her on April 28th, 2014. Anne had been married to her husband, Donald McGuire, for 37 years. The two had two daughters together, Carrie and Emma. She had also gone on to adopt her sister's two sons, Daniel and Andrew, after her sister unfortunately passed away. Anne had spent the past 40 years of her life teaching Spanish at the Corpus Christi Catholic College in Leeds, West Yorkshire, and England. She was set to retire in just a few months, and she was ready to move on to that next chapter in her life. Anne was very well loved by everyone around her. She was described as being so kind, compassionate, and loving. She had met her husband in 1972, and the two had a loving relationship. When they met, her husband was a math teacher, but he went on to open his own gardening business, but Anne stayed on her path to teaching. 
She dedicated her entire career to teaching Spanish to her classes of 15 and 16 year olds at the same school. Her husband had said that she absolutely loved teaching. It was her dream as a young child and her number one ambition in her teen years to become a teacher, and she was able to make that dream a reality for 40 years. Spanish was her subject and she was great at teaching it, but no matter how adored she was, no matter how talented she was at her job, she was always very humble. She had always emphasized just how much she learned from others over the years, and she was still learning every day. One of her former students went on to write that Anne always did what she could to make sure that you could learn what you needed to. She expected a lot out of her students, but she was always willing to be that person that could truly help her students get there. Yes, she expected a lot, but she was always there to answer questions, help her students, and be present for her students in a way that made sure that they were regarded with kindness and compassion. She always had a smile on her face, and her dedication truly showed every single day. Other students said that she was so kind to everyone, and others even said that she felt more like a friend than a teacher. One student said, quote, she was wonderful. She was just, she was so nice to everybody. She was kind. She'd always stay back late. Her main goal for everyone in that class, she just wanted them to come out on top and achieve what she knew that they could achieve. And you could tell she loved it. You could tell that she loved doing what she was doing every day. But she was just as loved by those in her family. Her brother-in-law went on to say, quote, her shining, fun, bright personality, which drew people to her. And when you were in her company, you always felt like you were the most important important person in her world. Her sister Denise said, quote, my carer, my protector, my teacher, my confidant, my role model, the person who inspired me the most in the last 20 years, she became my best friend in life. Anne was genuinely one of life's beautiful, selfless, extraordinary, kind people. She radiated happiness, joy, and positivity. Her smile lit up the room and people wanted to be around her. They were attracted to her energy and her zest for life. One of Anne's students was a 15-year-old boy named Will Cornick. Will Cornick was born on June 28, 1998 to his parents Ian and Michelle. He was overall described as being a good kid growing up with a good family. Now, when Will was four years old, his parents did end up getting a divorce and he ended up living with his mother and his brother. Obviously, this isn't something that's very easy to go through, but his parents tried their best to provide a safe, loving, and supportive home for their children. When Will was in seventh grade, he started school at Corpus Christi. He was described as a model student who didn't get into trouble and was pleasant to have in class. One teacher described him saying that he was, quote, a delightful pupil who always gave his best and was pleasant, positive, and cooperative with 100% attendance. He had also taken and passed five GCSE exams a year before his peers, so clearly he was excelling in school as well. Other students at the school described him as just a normal kid, just like any other student his age. Now, he was very tall for his age, standing at six feet two inches tall, but he was quiet and he mostly kept to himself and spent most of his time playing video games at home. But otherwise, those around him said that he was pretty nice and he had his small group of friends who he enjoyed being around. However, his personality seemed to change a little bit after receiving some life-changing news in 2010 when he was 12 years old. He and his family had gone on vacation to Cornwall when he suddenly collapsed out of nowhere. After this, he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. His family reported that he did not take this news very well, especially after finding out that he would now be unable to join the British Army, which is something that he had always wanted to do after graduating high school. He began self-harming around this time, which obviously really concerned his parents, but they said that this stopped pretty much as fast as it started and he seemed to be getting back to normal. But even though it seemed like his self-harming behavior stopped, after this diagnosis, he seemed to have some continued changes in his emotional well-being with relation to his diagnosis. His personality started to change a lot and he seemed to develop this intense, deep anger all of which seemed to be aimed at Anne, his teacher, and a bunch of other teachers at his school. He all of a sudden had this irrational hatred for Anne, who had been his Spanish teacher for the past four years. I have seen in some sources that because of how well Will had always done in school, Anne had maybe pushed him a little bit harder than the other teachers did. She knew Will's potential, so when he started to slack, she knew that he could do better. 
but Will did not respond well to this at all. This became evident to his mother in late 2013 when there was a parent-teacher conference. His mom had went to go talk to Anne or Miss McGuire as he knew her, but Will absolutely refused to see her that day. But what Will's mom did not know was that on the evening of Christmas Eve in 2013, Will had sent some messages to a friend where he said that he wanted to brutally kill Miss McGuire, and he said that he wanted to be caught so that he could go to jail and spend the rest of his days in jail so he would always have a nice place to live and wouldn't have to worry about money. In one message to this friend, he said, quote, as long as she's alive, I'll be depressed, sad, and angry. So there's only one thing to do. Then in January, he sent even more messages to a friend over Facebook. Now I'm not exactly sure if this was the same friend or a different friend, but based on what I was able to find, it seemed like it might've been the same friend. Either way, in these messages, he started to talk about killing some of the teachers at his school. In these messages, he said, quote, I'll break into the school and murder everybody inside at the current time, smash everything Spanish, McGuire, Colette, and Art, and then get drunk and do it again and steal everything of value and punch some walls. Just a suggestion. He then went on to say, quote, I want power. I want the capability or choice in a sense to be able to get told off by McGuire and for me to turn around with the skill, pride, and power and ax her effing cockles with a long and shiny blade. So all of this was going on behind the scenes, but I guess his parents didn't really know and neither did anybody else at the school. But by February 24th of 2014, Will had a confrontation of sorts with his teacher, Anne. He had failed to do his Spanish homework, so she decided that an appropriate punishment for him was for him to stay behind on the school field trip and his parents were called over to the school to discuss his behavior but he didn't listen and somehow he was able to end up going on this trip anyways so he didn't even end up having to stay back for it but this did not stop Will from becoming even more angry towards Anne. So the same evening after all of this happened, Will sent yet another disturbing message to a friend over Facebook. The message said in part, quote, the one absolute effing bitch that deserves more than death, more than pain and torture, and more than anything that we can understand. So obviously these messages are incredibly disturbing and something should have been done, but other than the friend or friends, again, I'm not sure exactly how many people, but other than these people that Will was messaging, no one around him even knew that he had these violent thoughts or tendencies. Everyone in his school, everyone in his family, all the peers around him said that on the outside, he was still a relatively normal and polite kid. He wasn't that kid that all of a sudden started showing violence at school and, you know, was writing violent papers and was starting to dress differently and was like, you know, stabbing his pencil into his paper while sitting at the desk or things like that. He didn't show any of those outward signs that we see in a a lot of other kids that end up harming someone at their school. But that was until everything came to a head on April 28th, 2014. That day, Will arrived to school with two knives in his backpack that he had grabbed from his kitchen. He had one knife, which was described as being large and heavy, measuring at eight inches long and two inches wide. And then he had another knife, which was much smaller. He had also grabbed a bottle of Jack Daniels whiskey and brought that to school in his backpack as well. When Will got to school, he had actually taken one of the knives out of his backpack and started flashing it around and showing it to some of his friends. He had casually told some of his friends what he intended on doing with that knife. He said that he intended to kill Anne with the knife as well as two other teachers. One of these teachers was pregnant and he said that he wanted to kill her, but that he wanted to specifically stab her in the stomach so that he could kill her unborn child as well. But apparently he said it in such a casual and joking tone, even sounding giddy and excited, that no one really thought that he was actually going to use the knife to harm anybody. But there was a couple students who did show concern, but anyone who did, anyone who thought that this isn't cool, you shouldn't be bringing a knife to school, anybody who showed outward signs of being concerned, Will had threatened to kill them if they told anybody. So even though Will had flashed these knives off to his peers at school and told people what he intended on doing with them, 
no one reported seeing him with these weapons. Will had attended his first two periods at school with the knives and whiskey in his backpack without any issues or without anybody seeing anything or noticing any odd behaviors from him. But his third period of the day was Spanish class with Miss McGuire. He went up to the fourth floor and sat down in class in room T51 before him and some of the other students were moved to room T50 so that they could work more productively. Once he sat down, Ms. McGuire had gone back into the other room to help the other students in room T51. But as they were sitting down, Will had grabbed the large knife out of his backpack and showed it to the kids sitting next to him. And he was asking him and, you know, trying to figure out where he should conceal the weapon. Once he found a good spot to conceal the weapon on his person, he stood up and then winked at his classmate before walking out of room T50 and back into room T51 where Anne was helping the other students. Anne had been at her desk in the front of the classroom, leaning away from the doorway that led into the classroom as she was helping another student. This is when Will rushed into the classroom and without hesitation, he ran up behind Miss McGuire and started stabbing her in the neck and back repeatedly in front of literally everybody in that classroom. Anne only stood at five feet, two inches tall, and she was very small, while Will stood, you know, a head taller than her. So even though she did try to retreat and get away, he overpowered her. She tried her best to run away and escape, but he just kept pursuing. It was absolutely brutal and just a level of violence that's even hard to fathom. As all of this was going on, of course, the other class full of teenagers ran out into the hall and they were screaming and they were trying to find literally anybody that could help them. This is when another teacher named Susan Francis had come out of her classroom after hearing all of the commotion and came out and saw all of these students screaming and running towards her. Then she saw Anne following closely behind these other students running towards her, holding the back of her neck, yelling, he stabbed me in the neck with Will chasing closely behind her. So acting as fast as she could, Susan grabbed Anne and pushed her into a classroom, shut the door and held her foot against the door to stop Will from entering the room. As soon as she did this, as she was holding her foot against the door, she could still see Will on the other side of the door through the glass panel and he was absolutely emotionless. He was neither happy nor angry or shocked. He literally just looked at Anne, looked at what he did, and he didn't even try to get into the room. He just gave up, turned around, and walked away. Of course, Susan then called emergency services to come to the school and help out. After this, Will calmly went back to the classroom that he had just been in and sat down next to a classmate. He literally acted as if nothing had just happened. He talked about how he stabbed Miss McGuire and all he had to say was that it was a pity that she wasn't dead. He then started talking about this adrenaline rush that he got from this and he said right in front of the class to everybody, quote, good times. One of the girls who had witnessed this entire thing said that it was obvious that Will was very pleased with what he had just done. Of course, as all of this commotion was going on, another one of the teachers walked into the room and that is when Will just held his hands above his head and he surrendered. He was then removed from the classroom by another teacher, which side note, that teacher is very brave for even going near him and putting hands on him but he was removed from the classroom and he was taken into the school's foyer to wait for police to arrive. Through this, he continued to act scarily casual. He talked to everybody as if nothing happened and went about his day as normally as he could, you know, given the circumstances. He was incredibly calm and collected. Literally, it was like if you had saw him and you didn't know what just happened, you would have no idea by his demeanor that he had just stabbed someone repeatedly. By the time police arrived to arrest Will, his demeanor did not change. He continued to act completely unfazed. He was calm, collected, and normal. He even asked the officer about what his favorite movie was and started talking about his favorite sports. And then as he was being taken away, he flashed a smile. As Will and the other teachers were waiting for police to arrive, Anne was fighting for her life in that classroom with Susan. This was so heartbreaking and gut-wrenching to read, but according to Susan, in this moment, she could tell that Anne probably was going to die. She did what she could to keep Anne calm and comfort her, but she knew that she 
probably was not going to survive this. So she made sure to speak about Anne's children and how loved Anne was by her family and everybody around her at that school and how it had been a pleasure to know her and to work with her. Susan tried her best to make Anne's last moments filled with her best memories of her favorite people. Of course, the ambulance arrived and they did what they could to rescue Anne, but her injuries were very severe. She had been stabbed a total of seven times to her neck and her upper back, with one of her worst injuries being a severed jugular vein. She also had two shattered ribs, with one of them puncturing her right lung. She was obviously taken into an ambulance and rushed to the hospital, but before she even arrived, she had died in that ambulance. She was pronounced dead at the Leeds General Infirmary at 1.10 p.m. One of the paramedics who saw the extent of Anne's injuries said that they were the worst stab wounds he's ever seen in his career. After being arrested, Will was detained at the Weatherby Young Offenders Institute near Leeds, but apparently there were concerns for his safety. So he ended up being transferred to the HM prison Hinley. Then by November 3rd, 2014, Will stood in front of a judge and he pled guilty to Anne McGuire's murder. But after this, there were so many things that needed to be considered in terms of sentencing because of course, Everybody involved in this case, including police, were absolutely shocked, not only at how all of this went down, but Will's bizarre behaviors afterwards. Again, he was incredibly calm. He showed no empathy. He showed absolutely no emotion whatsoever. So of course, because of this, he was taken in for an extensive psychiatric evaluation to see what could have possibly led to all of this happening. So the results of these psychiatric findings were all heard in front of a judge who went on to decide his sentencing. As we heard from before, Will had a very normal home life. Yes, his parents were divorced, but a lot of kids' parents get divorced. In fact, 50% of marriages end up in divorce. Psychologists would also go on to describe his childhood as being marked by love and support. He excelled in school, and he seemed to have a relatively normal social life. Yes, he may have been introverted, but he still had his group of friends, and being introverted doesn't mean that you have a horrible social life. The only thing in his childhood that anybody really could point to as being a traumatic event was the fact that he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes that prevented him from joining the army. Other than that, absolutely nothing could explain this. But these psychiatrists did get more of an insight into his state of mind and what took place in the weeks and months leading to the murder. It turned out that this murder had been planned very far in advance. As we saw in those messages that took place in the months before, he definitely had some thoughts of killing Anne for quite some time. He even tried paying another student at one point $10 to murder Anne, but obviously that didn't work and obviously that probably was not reported. However, he admitted to a psychiatrist that he had officially decided that he was going to go through with murdering Anne on Thursday, April 24th. He said that he had actually planned on killing himself because he thought that life was just miserable. He said that he made up his mind, quote, Quote, after months of thinking life is pretty effing shit. I couldn't see myself passing college and had no hope of doing anything. I tried to apply for the army, but they said no. He said that by Sunday of that weekend, he had officially decided on how he was going to do it. He said that he considered other options, such as hitting her with a blunt object, shooting her with a gun, or pushing her out of the window but he ultimately settled on stabbing her. But despite his planning and knowing what he was going to do, those around him did not notice anything out of the ordinary about his behavior. There was no shift or any outward indications to anybody that showed that he was planning this. He continued to act polite and happy all throughout the weekend of April 26th and 27. Then on the day of the murder, he grabbed these two knives and then put them in his backpack and then went to school. He said that he had also grabbed the Jack Daniels whiskey so that he could drink it in celebration afterwards. Then when he was asked about his feelings and thoughts after the murder took place, psychiatrists were absolutely shocked at the continued lack of emotion and empathy. He seemed proud of what he did and at one point he described Anne as barely human. He told the psychiatrist that after the murder, he wasn't in shock. He was happy. 
He said that he had a sense of pride and he still does. He said, quote, I knew what I was going to do. It was what I did. I said that I was going to do other stuff, but I never got the chance. Other murders. It was a triple homicide. What I have done, I don't give a shit. I wasn't in shock. I was happy. I had a sense of pride. I still do. I know it's uncivilized, but I know it's incredibly instinctual and human. Past generations of life, killing is a route to survival. It's kill or be killed. I did not have a choice. It was kill her or suicide. Then when Will was asked about what he thought about the impact that Miss McGuire's death had on her family and the school and the community, he said, quote, I couldn't give a shit. I know the victim's family will be upset, but I don't care. In my eyes, everything I've done is fine and dandy. So a total of three psychiatrists took part in interviewing and evaluating Will, and I will discuss now what each of them concluded. Dr. Diggle is an adolescent clinical psychologist, and he concluded that Will Cornick generally expresses strong feelings of anger, but this did not present much or at all in his outward presentation. He said that he felt this anger very strongly, but there wasn't really any provocation to cause this anger. He said that he had very little ability to constructively manage his angry thoughts. Dr. Lingua is a consultant child and adolescent forensic psychologist. He described Will's anger as premeditated and predatory. He said that one of the most dangerous aspects of his personality is the fact that he did not show any anger in his outward appearance and he did not disclose his anger to almost anybody. He concluded that Will's actions leading to the murder were, quote, pre-planned, goal-directed, and in full knowledge that they were wrong. He added that Will posed an extremely high risk of serious violence and that he cannot rule out the possibility that Will would kill again. Lastly, Dr. Kent was this case's leading psychiatric expert. He found that Will was of average intelligence. He found no evidence of any thought disorder, a psychiatric disorder, or any other psychiatric illness. He stated that Will does have an adjustment disorder, which did affect the development of his personality at a time where he should have been developing mature and independent characteristics. He noted a, quote, gross lack of empathy for his victim and a degree of callousness rarely seen in clinical practice. He said that Will presented a serious risk of harm to the public and that risk was immediate and unpredictable and it could cause a serious and lethal injury. So when he was deciding the sentencing, the judge had to consider the aggravating factors, many of which we have already discussed. The fact that there was extensive premeditation and planning and the fact that he had fantasized about the murder. The judge also pointed to the level of suffering that Anne faced before she died. She did not die immediately. She ran out of the classroom knowing what just happened and she suffered as she slowly died. The judge then pointed to the fact that he openly committed this murder in public in front of a classroom full of 15 and 16 year olds. Obviously, all of these students are completely traumatized for life from what they witnessed. The judge also referred to this murder as a level of violence that was savage and cowardly. He talked about how this was an attack on a little petite woman in her 60s from a boy that was over a foot taller than her with a massive kitchen knife. Then he continued to follow her as she tried to escape from the attack and he continued attacking her even though she was begging for her life. Then we know obviously about the total lack of empathy and complete disregard for anybody else that he may have traumatized. This is actually what the judge pointed to as being one of the most disturbing factors. The fact that he literally did not care about how many students he had permanently scarred. So the parliament law states that the minimum term for anybody under the 18 convicted of murder is 12 years. But the judge pointed to these aggravating factors as being enough to raise his minimum to 25 years. But then he also had to consider the mitigating factors. So he did point to the fact that Will did plead guilty to this murder, so they didn't have to go through a trial and all of that. Now, this factor is supposed to lower the sentence by four years, but the judge said that he's obviously going to plead guilty when he literally committed this murder in front of a whole classroom of people. He's not gonna try an innocent plea when all of these people saw exactly what he did. So he didn't put much weight into that as a mitigating factor. Then he also pointed to the fact that, yeah, he did have an adjustment disorder, 
but he went on to say that this had absolutely no effect on his criminal culpability. Then again, the last mitigating factor was obviously his age, the fact that he was only 15 years old and 10 months when he committed this murder. So after considering all of the aggravating and mitigating factors, the judge went on to decide that a minimum sentence of 20 years in prison was appropriate for William Cornick. So he will be up for parole in 2034, but the judge emphasized that it will be up to the parole board to decide if he is ever released. He said that he will have to be approved as not being a danger to himself or anybody else and deemed that he will not commit any more violent acts. So the judge said that it's quite possible that that day will never come. Of course, Will and his defense team tried to appeal the sentencing, but it was denied by a panel of three judges who cited that the sentencing that the judge came to was entirely the right decision. So even though Will is behind bars and even though he did accept responsibility for what he did, Anne's family is still left with so many questions. The fact that Will pled guilty means that there will really be no explanation, no cross-examination, no further questioning into his real motives. They were also frustrated that during the initial stages of this entire thing, there was more concern for making sure that Will's family was taken care of. They spoke in great length about how they were going to rehabilitate Will while giving Anne's husband and her family literally no information at all. Anne's husband said that no one even really told him about the extent of what happened until he got to the hospital and saw just how bad things were. And at that time, they didn't even tell him like that a student had stabbed her. They didn't even give them that information. So after all of this happened, Anne Anne's family submitted an inquest into her murder because they believed that this could have been prevented had the right actions been taken. Anne's family wondered how a 15-year-old kid had gone unchecked for so many months, how everyone around him talked about how good of a boy he was, how nobody could have possibly known that this would happen. But personally, I don't think that he was quite as good at hiding his anger as everybody says he is. I do think that a lot of red flags were ignored by a lot of people around him. I totally believe that he might have been a good kid growing up and that a lot of his past teachers didn't really see any concerning behaviors, but I think in the year before the murder took place, I think a lot of people ignored a lot of things. We can't really blame the friend that Will had been messaging for not reporting it because he's a teenager. Now, I know that's really frustrating for me to say, and I don't even want to say it, but at the end of the day, the adults in Will's life are the ones responsible for catching this behavior. I find it funny that everybody continued to say that he was such a good kid, yet he was fighting with his teacher. He refused to see his teacher during a parent-teacher conference. His own mother said that he had been self-harming before and she knew that he did not accept his diagnosis well. Yes, his mother thought that this behavior stopped and that he was feeling better, but him getting in trouble at school and getting into fights with his teacher and not doing his homework and doing all of these things should have been a red flag to his parents that maybe he's going through more than he's letting on. Not every teenager is going to tell their parents that they're still self-harming. Not every teenager is going to tell their parents that they're still dealing with really severe anger issues. It was up to Will's parents to catch these things before they escalated the way they did. But either way, a later inquest into her death found that nobody else besides Will is responsible for Anne's murder because there was no way that anybody could have predicted that this was going to happen. They said that Will and his friends had a dark sense of humor in which all of them would discuss hating people and violence in a way that outsiders would find disturbing. But they said that there was no way that anybody could have known that anything they were saying was serious because obviously the friends never went on to harm anybody. Will was the only one who did. They said that Will did not exhibit any behaviors that would have caught the eye of anybody that could have stopped this from happening. Then three years after after the murder, Will's father came out to say that he very much regrets what he did and that he's on the route to getting better. His dad went on to say that Will feels scared in prison, that he feels very isolated there. 
He said that he struggles with his own emotions and that he only trusts those in his family. He said that he visits his son once a month and the person that he was when he committed this is not the same person that he is now. The only explanation that Will ever came out with was years later, he went on to say that a red mist came over him in the moments before committing the murder and that he had actually wanted somebody to stop him from carrying out the attack. He also went on to say that he heard voices in his head which was telling him to do this, but this was thought to just be an excuse that he came up with so that he could spend his time in a hospital rather than in a prison. But I will also note that the prison guards in this case have come out to say that he has never once showed any sort of remorse the entire time that he's been in prison. So who knows what to believe? Obviously, Will's family is absolutely devastated. They obviously never wanted any of this to happen, and I'm sure they do truly regret any red flag that they noticed looking back that they didn't notice, you know, before all of this happened. But he will always be their son, so I'm sure that they want him to feel bad. I'm sure that they want him to have regret, so they truly think that he does. But personally, I don't think he still feels bad. I personally think that Will was one of those people who was born with something wrong in their head and he truly does not feel empathy. Empathy isn't something that you can learn. Even if you want to argue that a teenager's brain isn't developed yet, so they naturally just don't feel as much empathy as an adult, I don't think that matters. Because yes, it's true, a teenager's brain is not yet developed. They don't feel empathy the same as an adult does, but most teenagers show their lack of empathy by maybe being rude to their parents and saying things that they go on to regret or sneaking out and getting into trouble with little thought of the consequences. But at the end of the day, even teenagers, I know it's crazy, but even teenagers know the difference between right and wrong. And even if Will had snapped and had really bad mental health problems for whatever reason, and you know, did this out of anger and hatred or whatever, if he did snap one day and this happened, I think that any person with even a hint of emotion would go on to show regret and empathy in the moments and weeks after they murder somebody. But he never did. And according to prison staff, he continues not to do so. So no, I don't think he's capable of empathy and I don't think he's ever going to change. I don't think it comes down to him not being comfortable to show his emotions in front of other people outside of his family. Emotions are emotions and they are impossible to hide from everybody around you at all times. There are prison guards who work there 40 hours a week who probably see him 40 hours a week. There's other inmates there who see him 24 seven. I guarantee at some point something would have come out that he shows some sort of emotion even if he tries his best to hide them and keep them in. I guarantee something would have come out because even the people who are in the most control over their emotions will show it at some point. So I don't personally think that he should ever be released from prison. I think so many people will be in immense danger if he is ever let out. I know he was only 16 when he committed this, so this might be a hot take but I hope he never goes on to see the light of day. I care so much more about Anne and her family than I do about Will. I'm so happy to hear that he's having a rough time and that he isn't loving prison. And again, I hope he's in there for the rest of his life and I hope that he continues to have a really bad time. But that is all I have for today's case. I know this was a really tough one to listen to, especially since Will was so young, but I still feel that Anne's story deserved to be told. My heart absolutely breaks for her and the fact that she was so close to retiring when her life was taken from her. It really hurts my heart that after all of these years of working, after dedicating her life to these students for 40 years, she was finally gonna get to retire and enjoy her own life and do whatever she wanted and maybe travel and who knows what she wanted to do, but she never got to do that. She never got to retire and she never got to enjoy the rest of her life. It really hurts my heart the fact that her children lost a parent. Not only that, but her two sons lost two mothers. Those boys that she adopted had already lost their mother, so now they lost two mothers, and I can't even imagine the heartbreak and grief that they had to go through with that. Of course, my heart goes out to Anne and her family and every single student that had the honor of being in one of her classes and learning from her. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. 
If you liked today's video, please make sure to go ahead and leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and click the link down below and head over to glassesusa.com for 65% off of your pair of glasses. Make sure you go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure you send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.